Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. On February 1st, 2012, Just a few minutes before 8 p.m., 18-year-old Samantha Koenig was working alone inside a drive-up coffee stand in Anchorage, Alaska. Samantha was just about to finish her shift and close up shop when a man approached the service window and ordered an Americano. As she prepared his coffee in the tiny 5x9 space, Video footage from the security camera shows Samantha and her customer engaged in what appeared to be a friendly conversation. But after she set the cup down in front of him, the conversation stopped abruptly. Samantha looked startled and quickly put her hands up. She took a few steps backwards and turned off the lights in the shop. The footage from the camera went dark but you can still see her outline and movements despite the graininess of the video. At the same time, an outdoor camera recorded the shadowy figure of her customer, concealed by his bulky jacket and hood, now pointing a gun right through the window. Samantha went to the register, took out the cash, and set it down on the counter. Next, she moved cautiously to the window, turned her back to the stranger, and knelt down on the floor with her hands behind her. The gunman leaned halfway inside the opening and zip-tied her wrists together. And with very impressive agility, he jumped through the tiny service window. After he landed, the man closed the window of the tiny shack and appeared to be talking to Samantha. He knelt down next to her, wrapped his arm tightly around her shoulder, and continued to speak in her ear. Police would later learn that the man told Samantha that he was kidnapping her. After she protested that her family did not have any money, he brushed her off and said they would find a way to come up with the money. Then she told him her boyfriend was on his way to pick her up and would be there any minute. Again, the man seemed nonplussed and said if her boyfriend showed up, he would take him as well. He also warned Samantha that he was wearing an earpiece that was attached to a police scanner so he would know if she triggered the panic alarm by the cash register. Before taking her outside, the kidnapper stuck napkins into Samantha's mouth so she could not scream. He held onto her tightly as they walked towards the door. The last image the camera caught was of Samantha's face as they left. Her eyes were wet and full of terror, and rightly so, for the man that kidnapped her was named Israel Keys and he had no intention of waiting for a ransom. What he had planned for Samantha was much, much worse than kidnapping. As a Killer Psyche listener, you'll love Audible's new pulse-pounding collection of exclusive thrillers that are guaranteed to keep you on the edge of your seat. With captivating sound design, eerie soundscapes, and dynamic performances, their titles are brought to life. I recommend The Killer Across the Table by John Douglas, my mentor at the FBI Behavioral Science Unit, and his co-author Mark Olshacker. It is great. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. That's audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. Killer Psyche is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. 
Whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews or news, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue. And guess what? Now you can call them on your auto insurance too with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the third season of Killer Psyche. I was a psychiatric nurse, and then an FBI criminal profiler. In the five decades I've spent studying people's minds, I've interviewed countless murderers, including many serial killers. Why did they do it? To get a satisfying answer, we have to dive deep into their psyche to figure out what made them do what they did. This episode, is Israel Keys. Samantha was not lying about her boyfriend. The 18-year-old had been delayed at work and arrived at the coffee stand at 8.30. Upon seeing the shop closed up, he assumed that Samantha had gotten a ride home to the house they shared with her dad. He was not surprised since their relationship had recently become strained after Samantha accused him of flirting with other girls. So when he got home and she was not there, he did not alert anybody. He thought maybe she had just gone out. Her father, however, was not as calm about her absence. After she did not come home that night, he continued calling and texting her phone until it died. And the next day, her father showed up at Samantha's work for her 1 p.m. shift, but she did not show up. Samantha's father knew something had happened to her. But like other episodes we covered on our show, he had trouble convincing law enforcement. The Anchorage police detectives pointed to an angry text she sent to her boyfriend at 11.30 p.m., on the night she allegedly disappeared, saying, quote, F you, asshole. I know what you did. I am going to spend a couple of days with friends. Need time to think, plan, acting weird. Let my dad know. 18 hours after Samantha disappeared, a detective assigned to the case got the video footage from the coffee stand owner. But because Samantha's father was rumored To be a drug dealer, the police were still wary. They thought that the robbery kidnapping might be a setup and that Samantha and her father were in on it. Of course, there was no evidence whatsoever to that theory. There was a history of angry texting between Samantha and her boyfriend, and that made him a suspect as well. But after seeing the video of the gunman calmly binding Samantha's wrist and jumping through the service window, an FBI agent in the Anchorage field office assigned to the case, Stephen Payne, was convinced the kidnapping was real. Why did he think that? Well, he thought the kidnapper looked like he really knew what he was doing, and this was not his first abduction. He had no idea how right he was. Samantha's distraught father immediately mounted a Facebook campaign and printed up thousands of flyers with her picture and the word kidnapped printed across it in big red letters. He set up a reward fund for her return and the public responded and within days the fund grew to $30,000. Finally, 10 days after Samantha's disappearance, 
pushed into taking more action by the media coverage and the sizable reward fund, the Anchorage police pulled video from the surrounding businesses. And that is when their theory of the crime changed. The surveillance video taken from the Home Depot across the street showed Samantha and her kidnapper approaching a crosswalk at the busy six-lane highway at 8.20 p.m. Keys was gripping her tight to his side as they passed by other pedestrians. At one point, Samantha was able to break away and run, only to be caught a few seconds later when her abductor tackled her to the ground. Unfortunately, no one around them noticed. They continued walking until they reached a restaurant parking lot where Keyes' white Chevrolet Silverado pickup with no license plate was parked. There was a small group of people getting into the SUV parked next to his, and the video showed Keyes whispering something into Samantha's ear. Police would later learn that he threatened to shoot her if she tried anything again. But if she continued to cooperate, she would be released as soon as her family paid the ransom money. Safety tip, if somebody has a gun pointed at you, don't believe a single thing they say. Keys opened the front passenger door and Samantha compliantly got inside. The truck pulled out of the parking lot away from the watchful eyes of the surveillance cameras. It would take the FBI and the Anchorage Police Department weeks to piece together what happened next. Minutes after leaving the parking lot, Keyes stopped at a traffic light on the six-lane highway. A police cruiser with two officers pulled up beside them. Believing if she cooperated that she would survive, Samantha did not move or make a sound. When the light turned, the patrol car drove off ahead of them. Keyes first drove to a local park. He stopped there and removed the napkins from Samantha's mouth. He later said he was trying to be nice, so she would think he was, quote, normal but he knew he was not normal. With Samantha still sitting in the front passenger seat, Keyes got out and began transferring items from the back seat to the pickup bed. Keyes made Samantha lie down in the back seat. He zip-tied her wrist to a seat belt and covered her with drop cloths. It was now 10.30 p.m. Keys needed a burner cell phone to make the ransom call, but rather than purchase one, he decided it was less risky to return to the coffee stand and get Samantha's phone. He had accidentally left it there after dumping her purse. When police initially watched the coffee stand video, they stopped viewing at the moment Samantha was taken. Weeks passed before they watched the rest of the tape and made a shocking discovery. At 11 p.m., the kidnapper re-entered the coffee shop through the unlocked door. Keys picked up Samantha's phone and a few stray zip ties that he had dropped earlier. Then he straightened up the shop to make it look like Samantha had closed up and left on her own accord. It was a strategy to buy time, to make the morning shift worker think nothing was amiss. With Samantha still lying down on the back seat of his truck, Keyes drove to a second park, and at 11.30 p.m., he used Samantha's flip phone to send her boyfriend the angry text. He never had any intention of making a ransom call. When Samantha needed to use the bathroom, Keys tied a rope around her neck and led her a few feet from the truck. Afterwards, they sat in the park while Keys smoked a cigar. With her wrist still bound behind her back, 
and a rope around her neck, he forced Samantha to smoke it with him. Around midnight, Keyes pulled his truck into the driveway of his home. He assumed his girlfriend, a night owl, was still awake inside the house, but knew his 10-year-old daughter would be asleep. At 1.30 a.m., Keyes blindfolded Samantha and forced her to walk to a shed behind the house. The shed had been set up with space heaters, a sleeping pad, and blanket. Underneath that, a large tarp covered the floor. After moving Samantha's hands to the front, he tied the rope around her neck to the wall. Keyes demanded her home address and the description of the vehicle Samantha shared with her boyfriend. She told him that an ATM card to their shared bank account was in the car. At 2.30 a.m., Keyes turned on a radio in the shed and blasted heavy metal music to drown out any noise she might make to alert neighbors. Yes, I know that does not make sense, You'd think the music would have awakened someone, yet it did not. He downed a glass of wine in the house and logged on to MapQuest to get directions to Samantha's house. Shortly before 3 a.m., he used her keys to open the truck Samantha shared with her boyfriend and found Samantha's driver's license and the boyfriend's ATM card. Keys was about to leave when suddenly the front door opened. Samantha's boyfriend stood in the driveway staring at him. They were less than 20 feet apart. Keyes prepared to pull the knife from his front pocket. The frightened boyfriend quickly retreated back inside the house. Inexplicably, he did not tell anyone about the stranger until questioned by the Anchorage detective the next night. At 3.15 a.m., Keyes returned to the shed because he forgot the ATM's PIN number. This time, he scratched it into the face of the card and headed to the bank. He then made an unsuccessful attempt to withdraw money from Samantha and her boyfriend's account because it had less than a dollar in it. When he returned to the shed at 3.30 a.m., Keyes brutally raped Samantha and then put on leather gloves and strangled her to death. Then he stabbed her once in the back. This attack, along with others Keyes committed and alluded to have committed, was indescribably cruel and violent. I will not go into the horrific details, but there is a reason Keyes is known as one of the worst sadistic serial killers. After she died, he rolled her body up in the tarp and tucked it into the shed's cabinets. He turned off the heaters and locked the door. At 5 a.m., Keyes woke up his 10-year-old daughter and they went on a two-week vacation, eventually spending the second week with Keyes' family in Texas. During the last two days of his visit, he disappeared without telling anyone where he was. But we now know that at least one thing he did was rob a bank to repay his mother for the plane tickets she bought him. After that, Keyes and his daughter returned to Anchorage. Upon his return, he made plans to dispose of Samantha's body. It was frozen after being in sub-zero temperatures for 18 days. During the time he had been in the lower 48, the reward money for Samantha's return climbed to $41,000. And now he intended to be the one to get it. Keys would let them believe she was still alive. Over the next few days, he purchased makeup, a Polaroid camera, a typewriter, and fished a discarded newspaper out of a dumpster. The newspaper was dated February 13th, 2012, a day that he could prove he was in Houston, Texas. 
After thawing out her body, Keyes further defiled it sexually. Now you may think, oh my gosh, this is the worst thing I've ever heard. I don't ever recall hearing that about a serial killer. Well, it turns out many serial killers have post-mortem sex with a victim they killed. Even the handsome law student Ted Bundy and many, many others. Why do they do it? Here's why. The mere thought reliving the fantasy of the sexually motivated murder turns them on. And hey, if the victim's unconscious or, well, permanently unconscious, doesn't matter, they're still turned on. Then, in order to create a proof-of-life photo that was acceptable, he applied makeup to her face, made it look like her eyes were open, and held her head up with his hand while he snapped photos of her face alongside the February 13th newspaper. Inside the shed, he dismembered her body. Then he made three separate trips to discard her remains in an ice fishing shack in the middle of the frozen Mantasuka Lake. Each time, Keyes brought his fishing gear to avoid raising the other fishermen's suspicions. Once her body was gone, he took apart the shed and burned most of it, along with the clothes he had worn the night of the abduction. He then Xeroxed two of the Polaroid images and typed a rambling ransom note on the back. He wrote that Samantha almost escaped twice, but she was no longer in Alaska. Keyes made reference to the ATM card and demanded $30,000 be deposited into Samantha and her boyfriend's shared bank account. The note went on to say, if this and other demands were met, Samantha would be freed in six months. He folded the note into a Ziploc baggie and tacked it to a bulletin board in a dog park. Then he texted Samantha's boyfriend from her phone with the location. Days later, Samantha's father deposited $5,000 of the reward money into the empty bank account. And just hours later, Keyes successfully withdrew $500 twice within hours of each other. But because Samantha's father was the only person outside the task force who knew about the $5,000 deposit, the police found the immediate withdrawals suspicious. They continued to think that Samantha's father was involved. But their suspicions all went away on March 7th when $400 was withdrawn from Samantha's account with her ATM card in Wilcox, Arizona. Then, an hour later, there was a withdrawal in New Mexico and three days later in Texas. The FBI quickly deduced that Samantha's abductor was traveling east along Interstate 10. Then, on March 12th at 2.47 in the morning, the suspect withdrew money from an ATM in Texas off of Interstate 59. The FBI issued a BOLO, which means be on the lookout, for a man in a white Ford Focus traveling east toward El Paso, Texas. A Texas Ranger alerted local state troopers to check out rest stops, truck stops, and hotel parking lots along Interstate 59. Later that same day, a trooper spotted Keyes' car outside a motel just off the highway. That same Texas Ranger and an FBI agent arrived in minutes. While the agent went inside to the front desk, the trooper stayed outside. There, he observed a tall, athletic-looking man load the Ford Focus with luggage and then drive off. The trooper followed him and seven minutes later pulled the driver over for going two miles over the speed limit. The driver was 34-year-old Israel Keyes, a resident of Alaska. Keyes asked why he was pulled over when the trooper said it involved a 
kidnapping, Keyes immediately volunteered that he was in town for his sister's wedding. But once the Houston FBI agent arrived and peered into Keyes' vehicle, the jig was up. The Houston agent spotted a roll of rubber-banded cash in the passenger door pocket with red dye on it, a sign of bank robberies. That was enough probable cause to search the driver and the vehicle. They found Samantha Koenig's driver's license and her boyfriend's ATM card inside Keyes' wallet. He was immediately arrested for bank fraud connection with the boyfriend's ATM card. Finally, Israel Keyes was in custody. But that was just until the Alaskan FBI agent and the Anchorage police detective could fly in and bring Israel Keyes back to Alaska to stand trial for murder. Did you know that according to FBI property crime data, most home break-ins happen in broad daylight? As the days get longer this spring, protect your home with Simply Safe. Its advanced technology protects every room, window, and door of your home while cameras keep watch for suspicious activity 24-7, all for less than a dollar a day. And there's no long-term contract ever. I love Simply Safe because it's so straightforward and easy to install. Knowing that my home is protected 24-7 gives me so much peace of mind. It's great that I can always check on my home through the app on my phone. Protect your home today. My listeners get a special 20% off any new Simply Safe system when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com slash psyche. That's simplysafe.com slash psyche. There's no safe like Simply Safe. As a killer psyche listener, you're probably always trying to learn more about forensic science and criminology. I know I am. That's why I'm thrilled to partner with the University of Florida Forensic Science Online Graduate Program. Their completely online program is designed for working professionals. Over 1,500 students have earned their master's degree since the program began in 2000. Specialize in forensic science, forensic toxicology, DNA and serology, or in forensic drug chemistry to gain the skills, expertise, and credentials to move ahead in your forensic career. Ready to shape your future in forensic science? Join the world's largest forensic science program and alumni network at forensicscience.ufl.edu slash killer psyche. Israel Keyes was born on January 7, 1978 in Utah. He was the second oldest of 10 children. His parents, John and Heidi Keyes, were members of a sect of the Fundamentalist Church of Latter-day Saints. His mother, Heidi, homeschooled the children. In 1983, when Israel was five years old, his father quit the Fundamentalist Church and moved the family to a remote area in northeastern Washington. For the next 10 years, the family lived in the wilderness in tents and a one-room cabin without electricity or running water. Keyes' new church was called The Ark, which practiced white supremacist Christian ideology. Later, they became members of the Christian Israel Covenant Church that taught the intermingling of races was abominable and deviant. The Keyes children had to learn to hunt, fish, and forage, or else they would go hungry. They earned money through under-the-table jobs, like cutting firewood or working on farms. Israel and his brothers helped his father build cabins that they sold to other families, while they often continued living in tents. By age 14, Keyes stood six foot two. He admitted to shooting at neighbors' houses with his BB gun, 
starting fires in the woods, and breaking into houses for fun. He spent a lot of time alone in the woods and hunted, quote, anything with a heartbeat. He would sit still for hours, waiting for prey to cross his path. And that tells me how important killing for the thrill of it had become in his life. Even amongst other families who lived similarly isolated lives, Keyes stood out as, uh, well, creepy. He once admitted skinning a deer alive to his peers at church. Another time, He tortured a cat to death in front of other kids and laughed as the dying animal ran around in a panic. He found it amusing when another boy his age vomited in response to witnessing the incident. And it was at this point, 14-year-old Israel Keyes had an epiphany that he was different from his peers. Later, he told a psychiatrist, quote, I've known since I was 14 that there were things that I thought were normal and that were okay that nobody else seemed to think were normal and okay. As a result of this newfound self-realization, he kept his antisocial behavior to himself. But his mother noticed, quote, some troubling signs in her son during this period. Well, here's something about his mother. Heidi warned her 10 kids that the devil was everywhere, including movies, TV, and even radio, and blamed that and other influences for corrupting her son. Heidi was a religious fanatic and forbid her children from watching movies playing or even listening to musical instruments, which she said, quote, were against God. Could it be possible that his mother's version of Christianity was harmful to his upbringing and his view of the world? I think so, yes. Spiritual abuse, as it is called, happens when someone, in this case his mother, uses spiritual or religious beliefs to harm, frighten, or control the behavior of someone else. She abused him in this way, and psychological abuse can be just as damaging as any other kind. Let me be clear. When it comes to Israel Keyes' religious upbringing, it was extremely fundamentalist and severe and it was his mother's own twisted version of Christianity. In fact, as I've noted above, she taught her kids all kinds of things that were, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ah, ridiculous. Listening to music is, quote, against God? Yes, that is one of the many absurd things she taught her children. Israel probably believed everything she said when he was very young, as most children do. Then, as he grew older and developed his own sense of reasoning and logic, he saw that she was wrong, and he resented it, having been frightened by her needlessly. Or perhaps his mother's version of Christianity was harmful to him because her wide-ranging and oppressive missives had the exact opposite reaction in him that she was trying to get. And he rebelled by acting in a most horrible and unforgivable way. Is that possible? I think so. Not surprisingly, sometimes her children snuck behind her back to do the very thing she forbid. Imagine that a child living under insanely oppressive rules based on pleasing or displeasing God, acting out against it. By the time he was 16 years old, Keyes was a highly skilled carpenter. He built his first wooden cabin for his family to live in. 
in addition to his excellent carpentry skills, he knew how to build guns and make gun parts, including silencers. In 1996, his family relocated to a town along a river in central Oregon. At the same time, he became interested in Satanism and fantasized about committing ritualistic murder. The next summer, he attacked his first victim. Keyes was 19 and working near a popular place for inner tubers to float down the river. One day, he waded out into the water and grabbed a teenage girl who was straggling behind her group of friends. He dragged her to a remote campground bathroom, tied her up with ropes, and raped her. He had knives with him to use for his satanic ritual. Keyes planned to kill her and then dump her body in the campground toilet pit, where he thought it would never be discovered. Keyes would later recount the story of the inner tuber victim to a psychiatrist, saying that the girl was, quote, really scared. She kept saying she wasn't going to tell anybody. Keyes told her to shut up, but she kept talking. Quote, she was pretty smart. It worked. Things never really got violent like they could have if she had been fighting me. He let her go and then regretted it. He made up his mind to never let that happen again. Since he never got caught for that, I can only assume he regretted it because he really wanted to kill her. When he turned 20, his family moved across the country to Maine. They worked with the Amish community collecting sap from maple trees. About this time, Keyes told his family that he no longer believed in God. His parents responded by evicting him from the family home, and his younger siblings were told never to speak to him again. Did they say, oh, okay, well, we're sorry to hear that, but we still love you? No, they did not. They kicked him out of the house and forbid him from seeing his siblings or from even speaking to them. What kind of message might he have taken away from that rejection? How about, we love our idea of God more than we love you, so go away. Is it an accident or a fluke that a child raised in this manner turned out to be a serial killer? arguably the worst kind of sinner and one who does not care if he is forgiven or not. He grows up to be someone who abuses small animals, then elderly humans and defenseless young women. I'd say in this case, that is not an accident. Keyes moved to upstate New York, where he took a high school equivalency test and then enlisted in the Army. While he was stationed at Fort Lewis, south of Seattle, he started dating a woman from the Macaw Reservation. Before he was honorably discharged in July of 2001, the woman told him she was pregnant with their child. Keyes settled with her on the reservation and found work with the tribe's Parks and Recreation Department. His daughter was born in October of 2002. He was immediately protective of her and proved himself to be an attentive and caring father. You may wonder, how could someone be such a horrible person to women that are strangers or girls even, and yet be a loving father? I get asked that question a lot, and the truth is, a lot of serial killers love their children. They are able to do what's called compartmentalize the horrible part of their life. They can be a good dad and also a really good killer. After four years, he broke up with his girlfriend and began dating a nurse practitioner that he had met online. Keyes had primary custody of his daughter because her mother was battling substance abuse. Although Keyes had an alcohol problem, in fact, 
He even called himself an alcoholic. He was very careful not to drink around his friends, fearing he might let something slip. When his new girlfriend decided to move to Alaska, he followed her, taking his daughter with him. Between October of 2004 and March of 2012, he took at least 35 road trips and flights, traveling for weeks at a time throughout the continental United States, Canada, Mexico, and Hawaii. Some trips were recreational, but others were lethal excursions. But he enjoyed those just the same. Keyes had a signature strategy. He traveled hundreds and even thousands of miles, taking serpentine routes to a final destination where he would choose a random stranger to murder. He particularly liked murdering pairs of people. It would take the task force weeks to understand who Israel Keyes was, a serial killer with an untold number of victims. He chose them at random, mostly from rural, sparsely populated places. He liked outdoor spaces, campgrounds, trailheads, the mountains, riverbanks, lakes, cemeteries. He figured if he ran into anyone there, it would be easy to explain what he was doing there, just enjoying the great outdoors. Samantha Koenig was an exception in that she was in a much more public place with a lot of traffic when he kidnapped her. But like his other victims, she was a complete stranger. Before he kidnapped her, Keyes had cased a few roadside coffee stands and noticed that they were staffed by young female employees, mostly working alone. Another signature behavior was that he liked to bury what he called kill kits all over the country, and then he'd return to collect them months and even years later. He called them his cachet. These were five-gallon Home Depot buckets filled with cash, zip ties, ammunition, guns, silencers, duct tape, and Drano. He used that to accelerate human decomposition. Burying these kill kits enabled him to board an airplane without a weapon. And he would not use a credit card, which would tie him to a crime scene location. In all my years of studying serial killers, he is the only one I ever heard do something like that. Talk about meticulous planning. In June of 2011, he flew to Chicago and rented a car. He was supposedly going to visit his brother in Maine, but instead he drove to Vermont, where he retrieved one of his hidden caches he had buried two years earlier. Then he drove to a small town in Vermont where he spotted a house that he thought looked easy to enter. It was a single-story house with an attached garage, a floor plan he understood very well as a home builder. On the evening of June 8th, he left his car at the hotel where he was staying and made his way to the house on foot. First, he cut the phone lines into the house. Then he removed a ventilation fan that had been lodged in a garage window and pulled himself through. He picked up a crowbar in the garage before bursting into the master bedroom in what we call a blitz style of attack. The homeowners, a middle-aged couple, Bill and Lorraine Courier, were confused and he quickly overpowered them. He bound their wrists behind their backs with zip ties and then led them to their car, telling them they were being kidnapped. He drove them to an abandoned farmhouse in upstate New York, a property he had spotted a few days earlier. He raped and strangled the woman. He intended to rape the man as well, 
but he fought back. Keyes bludgeoned him with a shovel before shooting him. He poured Drano on the bodies, then packed them into garbage bags. He left them in the basement of the abandoned house. Six months later, when the house was demolished, no one checked the basement beforehand. Even though the courier's family had reported them missing and Keyes' confession started a forensic search, their bodies were never recovered. The only evidence tying Keyes to these murders was a three-day fishing license he pulled in Vermont, which placed him near the crime. His confession and two guns that he had tossed into a reservoir in Parrishville, New York. The FBI dive team was able to retrieve the firearms from the lake where he told them they would be. The Bureau worked for months to tie Keyes' known travel itineraries with missing person cases. But because he always removed his cell phone battery and SIM card when he traveled and used printed Google Maps, they needed his confessions to charge him. But Keyes, always seeking control, would only give them what they wanted if the task force was willing to meet his demands first. Getting the smile and confidence you've been dreaming about all from the comfort of your home isn't a total mystery with bite clear aligners. Just don't be surprised if all your friends start asking, what's your secret? Begin by ordering your at-home impression kit today for only $14.95. Bite Clear Aligners are doctor-directed and delivered to your door. Treatment costs thousands less than braces, plus they offer flexible financing, accept eligible insurance, and you can pay with your HSA FSA. Get 80% off your impression kit when you use code WONDERY at Byte.com. That's B-Y-T-E dot com. Start your confidence journey today with Byte. Ten days after his arrest in Lufkin, Texas, Keyes was transferred back to Anchorage, Alaska. FBI agent Steve Payne, Anchorage Police Detective Jeff Bell, and U.S. Attorney Kevin Feldes conducted over 40 hours of interviews with Keyes. Keyes told the task force, quote, You know, like I say, obviously you have no reason to trust me. But I can tell you right now, there is no one who knows me or who has ever known me, who knows anything about me, really. I'm two different people, basically. And the only person who knows about what I'm telling you, the kinds of things I'm telling you, is me. And he was not willing to give up the information they wanted without getting something in return. He wanted the task force to stop interviewing his girlfriend or searching her house. He was adamant that she was ignorant about his crimes. He also did not want the gruesome details of his crimes released to the media to protect his daughter. He confessed to killing Samantha and gave the location where he had disposed of her body the FBI forensic dive team recovered it. In addition to the Vermont couple, Bill and Lorraine Courier, Keyes alluded to at least eight more murders. After more than 40 hours of taped interviews, the FBI matched records of Keyes' travel with at least eight unsolved murders. They identified four victims who died in Washington state between 2005 and 2006, and also tied him to the death of a woman in upstate New York in 2009. Keyes also requested an expedited death penalty sentence, but the U.S. attorney could only speed up the process within the limits of the law, meaning the U.S. attorney could not say, okay, you get the death penalty tomorrow. Not willing to wait, on December 2nd, 2012, Israel Keyes took his own life in his jail cell. 
Inside his cell, he left 12 skulls on the wall, drawn with his own blood. He also left a blood-soaked suicide note. It has been said that the suicide note Keyes wrote is actually a poem. I thought it was very odd, so I reached out for the opinion of a published poet, Judith Ford, who also happens to be a retired psychotherapist and the author of the book Fever of Unknown Origin. And here is what she had to say about it. Quote, first thing I want to say is this is not a poem by any stretch of the imagination. It is not even a prose poem. It has no structure and it rambles all over the place. There is no focus except on showing us how extreme he is and showing off the workings of his ruined mind. He is vomiting up for display his toxic, narcissistic, rambling thoughts. We get a very good idea from this rambling of how twisted his mind is and how out of control he actually is, even though this so-called poem is his effort to be in control. The claim that this is on behalf of his daughter is ridiculous. How in the world could her knowing he committed suicide in jail be better than him spending the rest of his life in jail? Ford goes on to say that clinically, quote, he is not insane. That is obvious, but he is a toxic narcissist as well as a psychopath. A person can be both at once, or we could just say his diagnosis is all three, antisocial, psychopathic, and narcissistic personality disorders. His so-called poem is mere self-aggrandizing and is obviously another effort to stay completely in control, which was his main mission in life. Here again, he thinks he is in charge as he has to be forever. He comes out on top again, he thinks, and in a weird way, he is continuing the thrill of his destruction, his rapes, his torturing, and his murders. Lastly, Ford adds, quote, I was confused in the poem about who it was directed to. It sounded like he was talking to his victim. How utterly creepy. Or was he talking to his daughter? Or was he talking to himself? I think the latter is the truth. Close quote. You can decide for yourself. Keyes' note is all over the internet. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Anne Liu is our producer, and Jada Williams is our associate producer. Story research and additional writings by Anne Liu, Will Christensen, and Jada Williams. Mix and sound design by Aaron Bauman. Head of audio, Tom Monahan with audio assistance from Misuzu Enaga. For Wondery, Stephanie Wachmeen and Claire Chambers are producers, and Callum Plews is senior managing producer. The executive in charge of production for Treefort is Oscar Guido, and the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marsha Louie, Morgan Jones, and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondering. And last but not least, myself, Candace DeLong. 
The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. Keep your heart rate up month after month with Audible's pulse-pounding collection of mystery and thriller titles that you can't hear anywhere else. With captivating sound design, eerie soundscapes, and dynamic performances, you're guaranteed to stay gripped. As an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog. Check out We Play Games for a chilling psychological thriller about a seemingly perfect couple who loves to play a game only they know the rules to. Together, they scheme to manipulate those around them, and when their perfect facade crumbles, they turn the game on each other. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash thrill or text thrill to 500-500. That's audible.com slash thrill or text thrill to 500-500.